Well, thank you very much, Robin, and it's fantastic to be here at Chatham House today. The world is moving very fast, and ideas are moving even faster. This revolution is why we enjoy incredible freedom, powered by free enterprise and technology. Our businesses are driving the COVID recovery. Our scientists are saving the world through their miracle vaccines. And we're vaccinating the British population in record time. Yet this progress shouldn't blind us to the pitfalls. Hostile forces are using disinformation to undermine truth. Extremists are perpetuating malign ideologies through social media. Autocratic regimes are using this maelstrom of militancy, mistrust and misinformation to gain the upper hand. Now is the time for the free world to fight back and to use the power of economics and technology to promote freedom, not fear. Let's be honest. In recent years, the free world has taken its eye off the ball. After the collapse of communism, many breathed a sigh of relief and called it the end of history, confident that freedom and democracy would inexorably go global under its own steam. Societies turned inwards. Rather than engaging with the big ideas shaping the world, failed ideas ran rife, like the postmodernist philosophy that there is no objective truth. In fashionable circles, people talked about how we should be ashamed of our history and doubtful about our future. There was strategic drift. Defence spending fell. Countries became strategically dependent on cheap gas or reliant on others for vital technology like 5G. This complacency is being exploited by those who never stop fighting the global battle of ideas. They've been relentlessly building their influence, offering a quick buck to anyone who would take it, with strings attached for sovereignty and national security. It's time to wake up. The free world's age of introspection must end now. Instead, we need the age of ideas, influence and inspiration. And that's why Britain is determined to work with our friends to form a network of liberty that spans the world. As JFK put it, we will inspire others, not with an imperialism of force or fear, but the rule of courage and freedom and hope for the future of man. We know we will succeed because we are free and democratic nations. We believe in individual liberty, in humanity and dignity, and the power of people, the greatest transformative force on Earth. That is what our adversaries always get wrong. They put groups ahead of individuals. They want to make people work for the system. We want to make the system work for people. We know that when people have agency over their own lives, when they have freedom and opportunity, they achieve incredible things. This is the principle our country is based on. You can see it in the advancement of rights under Magna Carta, the establishment of the rule of law, or the pioneering of free market economics, all ideas that inspired the world. So it's time to be proud of who we are and what we stand for. It's time to dump the baggage holding us back. Our history, warts and all, makes us what we are today. Britain is the greatest country on earth. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, you can achieve your dreams. And that's why when I speak to foreign governments and businesses, they want to work with Britain. In my 12 weeks as foreign secretary, we've already secured partnership agreements with seven countries, from Greece to Israel to Malaysia. People want to do business with Britain. They trust us, and they see things in Britain that they would like for their own countries. They see that in Britain, your background is no barrier to becoming a chief executive, a top footballer, or the mayor of London. They recognize we're a science and tech superpower, home to the third largest number of tech unicorns in the world. They know we're an economic powerhouse, growing faster than any other G7 nation. From the Beatles to Sarah Gilbert to Tim Berners-Lee, we have unrivaled influence in the world. So our foreign policy will project pride in our country and in all its elements, including our great cities, our towns, and our countryside, whether it's by promoting our manufacturing, 
from Sunderland's electric cars to Derby's small modular nuclear reactors, or by bringing the world to Glasgow for COP26, which took a historic step forward in tackling climate change, or by bringing the G7 to Liverpool this weekend, a city whose global influence in culture, sport and music is stronger than ever. We have so much to be proud of. So I'm putting this at the heart of our Foreign Office's mission, to go out there influencing and inspiring others to join our cause. The office itself is a national asset. We have the best diplomats in the world and a diplomatic network with unique reach and expertise. It represents us across 180 countries, speaking 46 different languages, everything from Albanian to Urdu. The Henry Jackson Society's League Table ranks the UK as the second most powerful country on the globe, precisely because of our diplomatic clout. We're united with our friends and family across the Commonwealth, covering a third of the world's population. And our diplomatic heft has been shown time and time again. After the Salisbury attack, we worked with 27 other countries to lead the largest collective expulsion of Russian diplomats in foreign history. We were the first European country to impose sanctions on Belarus. And only last weekend, we lifted the US's decades-long ban on British lamb. So we will keep increasing our reach and strengthening our network. I've just cut the ribbon on new embassy buildings in Mexico City and Bangkok. And our formidable diplomatic machine will be put to work relentlessly promoting Britain. Our diplomats will go out there in a positive, proud and patriotic spirit. We won't lecture others. Instead, we will lead by example. We won't hand ring. Instead, we will reach out with our ideas and inspiration. We will be unashamedly commercial, hosting business delegations from our cities across the UK and paving the way towards new tech, trade and security agreements, which will help level up our country from Govan to Gloucester. And I, as Foreign Secretary, will empower the men and women across our embassies and high commissions with everything they need to go out there. Because we need to be on the front foot with our friends across the free world. The battle for economic influence is already in full flow. China now spends twice as much on development finance as the United States. 44 low and middle income countries have debts to Beijing in excess of 10% of their GDP. The EU relies on Russia for over 40% of its gas. And with some countries, Russia has a complete monopoly of supply. If Russia gets its way, Europe will be increasingly hooked on its gas. We have to end this strategic dependency. Whether it's on energy, investment or technology, we have to provide an alternative. And that means stepping up our engagement and our investment. It means shaping the economy, including the next wave of technology like quantum computing, 6G, artificial intelligence and much more. And the United Kingdom is in a unique position to lead the charge on this. After almost 50 years in the EU, once again, all the levers of international policy are in our hands. Diplomacy, development, trade and security. It's a new opportunity for the UK to shape the international agenda, an unfrozen moment that we must capitalise on. As an outward looking sovereign nation, we're rebuilding our muscle to fulfill the promise of global Britain, ready to win opportunities for our country and win the future for freedom. Our adversaries seek to use economics and technology as tools of control. We want to use them as tools of liberation and we will use all of Britain's influence, ideas and inspiration to achieve this. Firstly, we are reaching out to build new economic partnerships. Following our free trade agreements with 70 countries plus the EU, my successor, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, is pursuing a trade deal with India and accession to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And those will mean that two thirds of our trade will be covered by trade deals. We're also building new partnerships with low and middle income countries. We've launched British International Investment, our honest, reliable alternative 
providing infrastructure finance and support for the green transition. The BII will help deliver £8 billion a year in UK-backed financing by 2025, up from £1.5 billion last year. And we will leverage the firepower of the City of London. For the first time, we'll be supporting projects in Southeast Asia and the Caribbean, as well as Africa, drawing them closer to major free market democracies like the UK. And early next year, I will be launching our new development strategy. Alongside our new approach on investment, it will focus on providing women and girls with the freedom they need to succeed. It will commit us to stepping up our response to humanitarian crises around the world. And it will ensure our development policies support our belief in freedom and democracy. Second, as a science and tech superpower, we will make sure that the free world leads the way in technologies of the future. We're joining forces with our friends to win supremacy in areas like quantum, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and more. And we're forging new partnerships with fellow tech powerhouses like India, Indonesia, and Israel. We have a crack team of tech experts driving this forward in more than 40 diplomatic posts across the globe. And we're working with our friends to set standards in tech, from intellectual property to the free flow of data. This is just a glimpse of what's to come. We're negotiating new tech partnerships with the United States. Uh, we're in talks with Singapore and more. And in the new year, I will set out a new approach for the UK's tech leadership on the global stage. Thirdly, all of this has to be underpinned by stronger security ties. We are building a network of security partnerships to protect our people, our partners, and our freedoms, including on the high seas. We're forging cyber partnerships with allies around the world, from ASEAN to India, Canada, and more. And we're building our traditional security capabilities with the largest rise in defense spending for a generation. We're putting our money where our mouth is by devoting over 2% of our GDP to defense, making us Europe's largest NATO contributor. We're steadfast in NATO, the Five Eyes Intelligence Partnership, and the Five Power Defense Arrangements with Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, and Singapore. At the same time, we're going further and faster in other areas, such as our new AUKUS partnership. By joining forces with the US and Australia, we're protecting sea routes and stability across the Indo-Pacific. And we're deepening our work with Canada to cover regions such as the Arctic and beyond. We are working to advance our interests from a position of strength. Last week, I visited our troops in Estonia, and I joined NATO foreign ministers in Riga. Together, we will send a clear message that any incursion by Russia into Ukraine would be a strategic mistake. As President Biden said, there would be very real costs to pay. We stand with Ukraine in supporting their security and defense and helping them become more energy independent. Later today, I'll be meeting my Ukrainian counterpart, Dmitro Kaluba, to strengthen our ties further. We'll also work night and day to prevent the Iranian regime from ever getting a nuclear weapon. And we'll continue to work with our partners to respond to the security and humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. In all of these areas and more, we're taking the lead. We're seizing the initiative, and we're standing up for freedom and democracy. We're using all of our weight as the world's fifth largest economy. British international investment, leadership in technology, increased defense spending, and new deeper trade deals. We are getting out there to build the network of liberty and advance the frontiers of freedom. And I'm delighted to see that our friends are stepping up too. Japan has just appointed an economic security minister, and they're developing new technology like 6G. Australia is building trade and security links around the world. I want to see all of our allies step up and seize this moment. And I want to see all freedom-loving nations calling time on introspection, protectionism, and isolationism. When we put freedom first, we all benefit. The more freedom-loving countries trade with each other, 
build security links, invest in our partners, and pull more countries into the orbit of freedom, the safer and freer we all are. New agreements between like-minded countries, even when you're not part of them, are there to be celebrated. It isn't a zero-sum game. Friends want friends to be successful. When the US works on a new economic partnership with Japan, as Ambassador Tai has been doing with Minister Hayashi, or when the EU announces its new global gateway scheme to invest in developing countries, we all benefit. But we need to go further. I want to see our partners stepping up in funding NATO, cutting strategic dependence on Russian gas, putting more investment into developing countries, joining the CPTPP, and challenging malign acts. The G7 covers half of global GDP, and even more with our friends across the world, including ASEAN. By joining forces and bringing other freedom-loving nations with us, we will create the future we all want to see. So when I meet the G7 in Liverpool this weekend, my message will be clear. It's time to get on the front foot and join us in advancing the frontiers of freedom. It's time to dump the baggage, ditch the introspection, and step forward, proud of who we are, what we stand for, ready to shape the world anew. Let's stop fighting about the past. Let's start fighting for the future. By championing our ideas, building our influence, and inspiring others with our cause, we can forge ahead as a global network of liberty. That's how we will rise to the challenge in this fast-changing world. It's how we'll win the battle for ideas and influence once again. And it's how we'll ensure that free societies and democracies don't just survive, they thrive. Thank you.